Welcome to Introduction to Nanoscience. This first set of modules is going to cover Chapter 1, the introductory uh, chapter, and we'll start with a look at the contents of the book. The course comes with no prerequisites because the book introduces the needed background. Uh, first and foremost, in small systems one has to worry about quantum mechanical effects, and so chapter two is a um, pretty comprehensive introduction to quantum mechanics. I hope not too difficult, but it's also not trivial. Chapter three introduces statistical mechanics and chemical uh, kinetics, and importantly, the subjects of uh, fluctuations in small uh, systems. In the second part of the book, which I've called Tools, uh, we deal with the techniques that one needs to do things nano. So chapter four is uh, a description of microscopy on the nanoscale, that is visualizing nanostructures, a manipulation at the nanoscale, moving single molecules around, interrogating them with scanning probes and optical techniques, and so on. Chapters five and six deal with actually making nanostructures. In chapter five, we talk about the conventional ways of making nanostructures by hacking away at a piece of silicon. So that is nanolithography, so making nanostructures top-down, starting with a big piece of material and milling away at it till you have a small piece. And then in chapter six, we talk about the opposite approach, where one starts with individual atoms and molecules and puts them together to make a nanostructure by self-assembly. The third and final part of the book deals with applications of nanoscience. So chapter seven is a uh, reasonably comprehensive introduction to electrons in solid-state systems and we then discuss what happens to these systems as you narrow down the dimensions in, in some direction uh, to the nanoscale and uh, talk about unique electronic phenomena that occur in nanoscale structures. In chapter eight, we discuss the subject of molecular electronics, and I use this as an excuse to give a pretty comprehensive introduction to uh, chemistry and experimental techniques in chemistry like uh, electrochemistry and then go on to deal with the uh, electronic properties of molecular materials and single molecule electronics. In uh, chapter uh, nine, uh, we deal with nanostructured materials. Uh, since this is a subject that's very fast moving, we try and emphasize the basics. And in particular, what happens to the properties of materials if we make some dimension small? So for example, if we make one dimensional small to make a layered material, um, two dimensions are small uh, to make a small enclosure, then three dimensions small to make a quantum dot. And of course, what small means depends on the length scale of the phenomenon we talk about, uh, but all of the nano-engineered materials are having common constraining the motion of excitations in one dimension or another uh, on the nanoscale. And then finally, perhaps as a culmination of our emphasis uh, through many parts of this book on fluctuations in small systems, we discuss nanobiology and put particular emphasis on the role of fluctuations in the nanosystems that are uh, individual cells uh, or gene control mechanisms in cells and uh, end up uh, discussing the way in which uh, fluctuations play an important role in the assembly of complete organisms like, uh, indeed, our human brain. So in chapter one, we're going to talk, first of all, a little bit about size scales. People accept that nanoscience and the nanoscale is something remarkable, perhaps without understanding just how amazingly small nano really is. So that's our first task. I'll then touch briefly on history of nanoscience. It's generally regarded as starting in the modern era with a famous talk by Richard Feynman. And so we'll cover some of the implications of that. Um, mention very briefly the role of quantum mechanics and uh, then talk somewhat more about fluctuations in small systems because that's a very important part of this book and I think a very important part of the subject that's not been emphasized enough to date. All right, so let's deal with the subject of um, size scales. This little exercise here is to illustrate just how big Avogadro's number is. Just to remind you 
Avogadro's number is the number of atoms or molecules in one gram mole of a substance. And as you probably learned in high school, that is 6 times 10 to the 23. And once again, that's the number of atoms or molecules in one gram mole. So, for example, nitrogen has an atomic weight of uh, 14. So 14 grams of nitrogen would contain Avogadro's number of nitrogen atoms. But nitrogen always comes as N2 molecules, and that has an atomic weight of 28. So 28 grams of nitrogen would contain Avogadro's number of molecules. So what we're going to do here is look at the following question. On the Ides of March, some 2,000 years ago, as Caesar died from a knife wound, he exhaled his very last lungful of air. Now, a lung contains about one litre of gas, and if you do the appropriate problem at the back of the chapter, you'll see that one mole of an ideal gas occupies 22.4 litres. This number comes from the ideal gas law, which you can solve for the volume at normal temperature and pressure to obtain this number of 22.4 litres. So one litre then, being exhaled from a lung, is equivalent to about 0 0.05 moles of gas, predominantly nitrogen. So then we're going to ask, what's the probability that one of the nitrogen molecules that came out of Caesar's lung 2,000 years ago is at this very second entering our own lungs as we breathe in? So, to do this problem, let's ask what fraction of the Earth's atmosphere corresponds to nitrogen atoms or molecules that left Caesar's lungs 2,000 years ago. Alright, so we know that we're 0.05 moles of them. And then the question is, how many moles of nitrogen are there in the entire atmosphere? And the answer turns out to be about 2 times 10 to the 20, and I show you on the slide how I got that number. So this fraction, 0 0.05 moles, divided by 2 times 10 to the 20 uh, moles, um, gives you the number of moles um, that came out of Caesar's lungs. If we multiply this by the number of uh, molecules entering our lungs with each breath, well, each time we breathe in, there's 0 0.05 moles going into our lungs, and one mole has 6 times 10 to the 23 molecules. So, look at this. You'll see already that the number of moles of nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere uh, is comparable to the number of molecules in our lungs. And indeed, when you multiply these numbers out, you'll see that around seven and a half molecules of nitrogen that were in Caesar's lungs in his last breath are entering our lungs on each and every breath. So, roughly speaking, the ratio of the uh, volume occupied by a few molecules uh, to the air in our lungs is the same as the ratio of the volume occupied by one lungful of air to the entire volume of the Earth's atmosphere. So that gives you some idea of just how small the atomic scale is. To set the atomic scale in, uh, in context, a hydrogen atom is around about half an angstrom an angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer, and so that's therefore 0 0.05 nanometers.